Thank you so much. So let's move on to the third topic. So in your professional life, discuss one time when you became very aware of race. Uh, Trisha, why don't you begin since you already started talking about it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I had like a few, where did my thing, I have my cheat notes. Where did they go? Oh no. Oh, here they are. Okay. I've been, I was so nervous about this that I had to write everything down. So, <laughs> so if I'm like doing like a teleprompter situation and you see my eyes going like that, sorry, that's, I'm just trying to lose, not lose my crap. So anyway, um, yeah, there were a few, <laughs> but I thought I would start with like, there are three that I kind of want to talk about, but one of them was like, okay, so I played this like house concert with my like with my band, like my ensemble a few years ago and it was this fancy house in LA in the hills, like, like typically like very, very wealthy people who wanted us to do a thing for them that they were fundraising and it's all good work is for like a children's hospital and whatever. We play, everybody's eating fancy hors d'oeuvres and they're pretty trashed, you know? And so the guy who's the host, you know, again, I feel like we're constantly like, did he really mean it? So he comes up to me and he says, um, he starts like, you know, just getting very theatrical and saying, you know, you guys play really well and blah, 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 and great, good job for you. And I was like, yeah, thanks. And he goes, um, and I'm the only one in my group that is like noticeably not white. <laughs> so that's another thing. It's like, am I being crazy or is this actually thing? So he comes up to me and he says, you know, we, my wife and I have tickets to the LA Phil and we've been subscriber for, subscribers for years and we've been watching that the, the demographic of the audience has been noticeably getting more and more like white and old and like, you know, white haired people and, and the only people, the only young people who come are like Asians. And then he goes to me, so why is that? Why do Asians like, why do you like classical music? Like, what is that about? And okay, so then I was in this moment where I was like, hmm like what do I do and and so I just sort of said well I don't really know that I can answer that and blah 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 and I kind of like evaded the question and then but the part that really that was okay fine neither here nor there but the part that really disturbed me was that after the fact I got in the car with two of my colleagues and one of their mothers and um I sort of relayed to them that this had happened and um I thought for sure that they would be like oh yeah that's weird like what that's like a for somebody to come up to you and say ask you to speak on behalf of all asian like asian as a term is a problematic container like it doesn't like that's like saying i don't know i don't know like all meat is meat i don't know it's like a terrible metaphor but you know what i mean it's like not it's not enough it's it's again this lack of language that we have that these things conversations like this are helping and they got really upset with me and the a number of things that came up, one was that one of them said, why are you so sensitive? Like literally the stereotypical, like, why are you so sensitive? That man clearly wasn't being racist and you are seeing racism where there isn't racism. If I went to Harlem and I sub observed that, oh, there are a lot of black people here. Does that make me racist? And then the mother of one of them actually said to me, that she didn't believe racism against Asians was actually a thing, like especially in classical music. And that the reason for that was that her son, um, she started to say, my son has grown up in classical music surrounded by Asians who like beat him at competitions all the time. So how can you possibly say that there are racist tendencies in a system that, necess that really like ele se seemingly elevates Asians? And that to me was like, again, I was like tongue tied in that moment. And it got really like, I tried to explain what microaggressions were and there was all this pushback and they were like, you're, micro now, you're now microaggressing me. <laughs> like, it got very heated. And I didn't have the wherewithal of the language and I was really taken aback by that moment. I was not expecting that. I felt like that was a safe space. These are colleagues and friends and, and it clearly wasn't. And I felt really like, oh, even here, I, I don't belong. And it just made me think a lot about sort of the myth of American meritocracy, which says that it's, again, it's another binary. It's like, if you are quote unquote successful, then you are just by evidence of your success, you are, uh, you cannot possibly have had the experience of bias, like that these things are somehow separate. Um, and that's one of the things I think a lot about because it's true that, you know, if you look at any symphony orchestra, it's filled with Asian musicians. But then when you look at 
positions of administrative power and executive power, are we seeing that same representation? No. And I think that what you see in classical music is also demonstrably evident in just the larger dominant culture. Like that there's this idea that, yeah, we are, and it's again, it's a, it's a, it's a misinformed bias. There seems to be this model minority ideal that, oh, they're fine. Like Asians are fine. But like that, and that's just one experience that I had, you know, I've had other experiences where, yeah, like a, a, a donor said to me, oh, you should meet your, you should meet my son. He would like you. He was, a, he's, a, his son's a musician. And I was like, oh, okay. And he goes, um, yeah, he likes Asian girls and he, he has a Chinese girlfriend. And I was like, and I, again, am stuck in this situation where I'm like, you're a donor. I can't piss you off. You're part of a community that I'm trying to make my place in. But what you said is so friggin' offensive on so many levels that I can't even start to talk to you. You know what I mean? Um, and again, being smacked in the face with this realization that, oh, I don't belong. I'm an object. I don't have agency. Like, I need to somehow go out and get it. So. Thank you so much. Uh, Tiffany. Um, yeah, I mean, I've definitely had experiences similar to yours, Trisha. Um, lots of microaggressions, lots of weird stuff. And, and to add on top of, right, being Asian American, being a person of color, I have the hop up problems, hop up people problems, right? So now I've got, I teach in Asian American studies often. And so I always feel this obligation to walk into the room and be like, hi, I'm Tiffany, I'm Cambodian American. And my research is on Cambodian American culture production. And it's okay because I'm Cambodian American. You know, I always feel like I have to throw that out there. Um, so I've got the added hop of problems on top of things, but I've, I've been invited to speak on like these panels that uh, uh, where I was the token Asian person and meant to represent the Asian American perspective on topics that you know where my voice should not be the voice that's um, the one that's got, gone to first you know like go to the other people's voices first and then you can come to my perspective after those people have, it's that pass the mic thing, you know what I mean? Like, who do you pass the mic to? Please don't pass it to me first when it's not about my community, you know? So I've had like panel situations where I've, I've had to be the token, um, you know, per person for, for those things. Um, but I, you know, I just, my entire life have had to deal with so many weird, mixed um, aggressions and microaggressions in my, you know, both personal and professional life. I've had to deal with students that don't have a filter and don't understand um, how to be respectful of a woman of color that's teaching them, right? I've had to deal with um, people that have told me that I'm not Cambodian enough to be performing on certain stages or uh, in certain, you know, roles in the pieces that I've been in. So, you know, it's, I, I don't, I'm not at the point where I'm comfortable to be like, this is exactly what happened yet. But, you know, those are, um, I feel like as a mixed race, Asian American person, my body, my identity, my voice has been so managed by the, forces in the community around me that every single or not every single but most of the interactions that I have with people that don't know me in some way become you know fueled by some sort of weird racial tension so hashtag hop of people problems <laughs> it's real thank you uh Kim Um, yeah, I was, I was thinking about this question, this prompt, and um, I think, I w well, I was trying to figure out if there were any times when I was unaware of my race, because I think it's pretty consistent that I'm constantly aware of my race in whatever space I'm in. Um, but sometimes it can be 
um, super empowering to be aware of my race, right? So when I, you know, when I walk into the, uh, the lecturer's office at the Asian American Studies Department at UCLA and I see myself surrounded by other Asian American scholars, um, educators, um, uh, activists, community folks, um, I'm, I'm very aware of that I'm Vietnamese, that I'm Asian American. Um, and I mean, the, the only reason why the, that department even exists is because of, um, you know, student protests in the 60s and 70s that demanded recognition of ethnic studies. Um, so it's in the founding of, of the department itself and the field itself. Um, so, so there are times when I'm very aware and it's, it's a wonderful thing to feel um, kind of completely seen and able to express all parts of my identity um, um, openly and feel accepted and supported by a community in that way. Um, and then there are other times, um, you know, and this is kind of the more common experience that I've had. I, I, I can't count how many times this has happened. And unfortunately, I think it tends to happen more in the music spaces that I'm in, um, if they are kind of more based on the uh, conservatory education model type spaces. Um, you know, maybe I'll be walking down the hallway towards the faculty offices and, uh, you know, someone will ask me, you know, if I know where I'm going or if I need any help. Um, and basically saying that, do you, or do you belong here or not? Um, and I have to kind of assert myself in those situations, right, and say, yes, this face that looks like this, this body that looks maybe an age that you're um, assuming about me and um, my gender as well, um, all those things mixed together. Um, I, th that image, um, you know, who I am belongs here in this space. Um, and so um, that's a different kind of um, awareness of your race, right, where you're not able to feel fully seen by other people for who you are um, and their preconceptions, of course, get in the way. Um, but um, yeah, those are those are kind of things that happen a lot in my daily life, either the empowerment <laughs> by being surrounded by, you know, other Asian American studies folks um, or just in the community. Um, and then um, that kind of um, almost harsh reality where, um, you know, not all spaces in the world are that supportive. Um, but I, I, I try and draw on that energy that I get from, um, you know, my, my tribe, my folks that are supporting me in order to kind of have the strength to deal with the rest of the world that's not quite as um, accepting and um, ready to, um, you know, see us as fully who we are. Thank you, thank you. So, Joe. I'm going to say this with awareness that I'm pretty privileged to be able to say this. Um, I'm a dude. I was born in China in the homogeny of China where everybody looked like me. My family was well off for what um, our community was. And so I was spoiled. And I definitely got the spoiled brat in me knocked out of me when I moved to the U.S. Um, but for the for the better, I think, because when I moved here, I realized, oh, okay, so I'm no longer on the top of the food chain. I'm, I'm the other now. And I operated my, most of my adolescence with that mentality that I am not American. I'm a foreigner and I have to either blend in or I have to stand out in a way where I, you know, I have to survive. Um, but in, in that, I feel like I feel very different than a lot of you who have to deal with this question of are you are you an American or do you belong here because I would answer right away like I don't belong here based on the fact that I'm technically from somewhere else but I can make myself belong here by what I do so that's 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 my relationship to the world that has you know it's helped in certain things certain ways but it also kept me kind of blind to a lot of the issues that actual Asian Americans have dealt with like the stories that you guys are talking about um, but so my story is a little less, it's, it's, it's kind of just goofy, but this happened. So I was on a film set early on in my filmmaking or video making career. And we're just goofing off, goofing off by the craft service table. And the gaffer, the lighting guy was playing with some tape and he had all these strips of tape. And then he just kind of was like making funny face mustache things. And at one point he had a Fu Manchu mustache. And he was like, hey, Fu Manchu. And I wasn't even really close to them right there. So I, I saw it, I kind of laughed and I just you know went about my business. 
And a short while later, my boss, Will, who is an absolute beautiful human being, he is such a good person. Um, I love him. He taught me pretty much everything I need to know about video production. He drags the, the gaffer guy over to me and was like, explain yourself. And the gaffer guy was all shook up. And he's like, oh, I'm so sorry, Joe. I didn't mean to offend you. I was just joking around. And I was like, what? What are you done? That was funny. I liked it. Don't worry about it. And at that moment, it clicked that I was the only Asian person on this entire set. And that what he was doing, the, the mustache thing, should have been offended to, offensive to me. But I wasn't aware of that. And also, I personally, from my privilege standpoint, I would probably do something similar. Like, I, I'm sure I've done the Hitler mustache before with the tape. And that, that says a lot about, you know, where I come from, from the privilege and not, not having the awareness of all these things. But at that moment, I'm like, oh, wait, I need to actually, should I feel something? Why don't I feel anything? And why am I the only Asian on set? Um, and so I don't, I don't think I truly learn anything from that experience other than just becoming aware of it. It took me years before I realized, okay, there's all these levels to, you know, what, what is, what is racist, what is offensive and what is just ignorance or an accident, or maybe it is comedy. Maybe he was funny, but maybe because he wasn't pre presenting it as comedy, it could be easily interpreted as microaggression or racism. Um, but that was probably like one of the first times where even though I'm aware that I am a foreigner, at that moment, I realize I'm Asian, not everybody else in that room. Thank you. Anyone want to react to uh, each other's story? Erica, I don't think we could hear you. Hi, do, uh, do you want to react to each other's story? That's all I said. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, thank you guys all so much for sharing all of, you know, your experiences and your stories. I think that this is all really important to, to think about. Um, and, and, you know, I want to comment on, um, Joe, your statement about, you know, I don't belong here in America, but I can make myself belong here you know, like what even is belonging in the United States, right? Natives are the ones that belong here. This country is uh, based on settler colonialism, genocide, and, you know, imperialism. Like, I really think that um, belonging is such a, um, a more complicated, uh, complicated thing than, you know, it, it's kind of, shown to be, right? Belonging, we often perceive to be whiteness, and that's not necessarily like the reality of how, of, of history, right? So I want to urge all of us to feel like, you know what, maybe none of us belong necessarily, but we're here because of how the world, you know, has, how, how things have happened in the world. And so how can we make this a place where we can all really coexist um, and support one another well and still think back to um, and, and teach these histories of people that have been brought here or taken from here or marginalized or, you know, whatever else. Like, how can we shift our own thinking around belonging in order to essentially, you know, make this country a little more accepting of bodies and people of, of color um, and to decolonize our, our own mindsets about being here. You know? And I want to also point out the fact that I, in China, at least I, the way I grew up is I do belong in China because this is my homeland and we're the center. I mean, China is literally center of the world. Zhongguo is the center of the world so there at least as a spoiled kid i was definitely spoiled um in my mind i belonged there that was my like my 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 city basically because in my mind my grandpa ran the city um but yeah to come here like to have that shattered i i definitely use that as my like defensive mechanism too to be like oh it's okay if you're questioning whether i should be here or not i'm just gonna go around you and now and that's not necessarily good at it. i'm sure there's so many immigrants no i think it's a very understanding like way of in a very like empathetic kind way that you went about um 
your life with that, with that being like, yeah, I get where you're coming from, I guess, but you know, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm here. So, you know, deal with it. <laughs> Nine will leave. I love that. Yeah. Leave. <laughs> Um, I, uh, when Trisha, you were um, telling your story and you mentioned how even the term Asian is problematic in some ways, um, it made me think of how, um, you know, I've been, I've been kind of pondering about how that term is probably a Western conception. Um, it doesn't really make sense to lump together the two most populous, most diverse countries in the world, right? Just for example, just two countries, like China and India, just lumping those giant diverse countries together into one continent, not to mention any of the other, you know, many, many other countries and cultures and the diversity within each country. Um, it, 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 it's very much, um, you know, this idea of centering the West and then just saying everybody else is Asian. Right. And kind of just erasing all of that difference. Um, so um, and, and I guess in some ways, a, the term Asian American was a, um, a reaction to that. Right. Um, kind, kind of trying to replace the term Oriental with Asian American. And the Orient kind of has that same lumping together um, and centering of the West as well. Um, so yeah, that it just kind of triggered that thought when you when you told your story. Right, and and, and you know in U.S. history there is the Asian Exclusion Act, right? right. Largely, in, in many ways, define what is Asia. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, Trisha, do you have something to say? You unmuted. Oh uh, no, I just wanted to say that you know. Um, there's this professor at Columbia University called Daryl Dwing Su, who I've like read a lot about, you know, a lot of his papers and like he speaks very eloquently and I found like what he talks about and how he defines microaggressions very helpful again in terms of finding language. And one of the things that he says is like white people are not the problem, white supremacy is the problem. You know, the idea that you're elevating one, as you're saying, centering one culture, one, I mean, even whiteness in and of itself is also problematic. It's like, what does that mean? That also is, you know, effectively erasing all the individual narratives within that concept, you know, but that's all I wanted to say that it's uh, like white people are not, it's just, it's this, it's the conceptualization that, that there's superiority and then there's then, um, there's a right to oppress other people because of that. 